My name is Joel Garrison. I'm a hypercurious learner and a lover of the sense of sight. I'm delighted to moderate this podcast dedicated to sight on behalf of the Internet of Senses Institute. Today, we are incredibly excited to speak with an individual on the cutting edge of using virtual reality or VR as experiential learning in the university setting. Let me welcome to the audience, Humberto Coronado. Humberto is director of the Master of Science in Supply Chain Management at the Robert H. Smith School of Business. He's also a senior lecturer that teaches graduate level business and supply chain management courses. Humberto has over 15 years of industry experience in logistics and supply chain management he earned a bachelor's degree in business from the Universidad Autónoma de Colombia. Please pardon my Spanish there. You're good. I, uh, am, am not very fluent in Spanish. He then completed a master of professional studies in supply chain management from the Pennsylvania State University and a master of business administration with an emphasis in accounting and finance from the Robert H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland. He is also a certified supply chain professional. Humberto, before we discuss the academic side of your work, please tell us more about your life story. Where did you grow up and how did you become a passionate educator at the University of Maryland? Joe, first of all, thank you for having me today. I'm, I'm very delighted and excited about being on your show. So here's my little story. I was born and raised in the Caribbean coast of Colombia in uh, a town called Barranquilla. Uh, this is a town of maybe, you know, Sofia Vergara, Shakira. You know, fun fact here, I'm within one degree of separation from both of them. Anyway, I grew up like almost every other kid in my generation in Colombia, watching MTV, playing soccer, and of course, drinking the best coffee in the world. Later on, I went to college, you know, like, as I said, like every other kid in my generation, went to college, and as you said, graduated, you know, from uh, Universidad Autónoma del Caribe with a bachelor's degree in business administration and a minor in marketing and communications. And I was looking to start my business career in international business and logistics working for some of the world's largest ocean carriers, such as Evergreen Marine, EWL, APL, and a few others. I even went on to co-found a small 3PL, third-party logistics provider in Colombia. And it was during those years that I started teaching at a small college in my hometown in the evenings. You know, later on, I moved to the US and I had the opportunity to leverage my all my business experience to work for some of the Fortune 500 companies that that you know you know such as Coca Cola, FedEx, Walmart in in operations related roles. I ended up years later, as you said during your introduction, pursuing graduate education in supply chain management as well as an MBA. And I've always been curious about education. You know, it, it runs in the family. At some point um, in her life, my mom was a kindergarten. My mom was a stay-at-home uh, mom, but uh, in her life at some point, she was a kindergarten teacher. My youngest brother is a language teacher. And my eldest brother is also an elementary teacher here in the US. At some point, he was also a, a I think, a principal of a school in North Carolina. Prior to coming to Maryland, I was working for the largest provider of online education for the armed forces in the United States. I was tasked with growing the market for their equivalent program in supply chain management. My role there was to establish strategic alliances with corporations so that they could get trained in supply chain management via online education. And, you know, I was getting more of this field, uh, this field of the education field. And when the opportunity to work for the University of Maryland presented itself, I just jumped at it. 
I started at UMD about uh, 10 years ago as the Associate Director for the Amity Supply Chain Management. Fast forward 10 years and I am the Academic Director now. I must say, you know, I have been extremely lucky to have had along the way great mentors that have made this long-term career a success at Maryland, and, and I'm very grateful for that. And in addition to being the academic director for the program, I also teach supply chain related courses at all levels, from undergraduates to MBAs. Wow, that is a very impressive background. You could definitely say that education uh, runs in, in your family. I'm, I'm, I'm interested, I'm curious now, how how did you get attracted to, to business? I clearly see a direct line that led you to becoming a passionate educator. But uh, what 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 really was there a moment in college or some point in your life when you decided, hey, supply chain management, that's the thing for me? That's a great question. I get students ask me that a lot. <laughs> Let me tell you, uh, it, it's a funny story because, because you know, here's a, a logistician's job. You know, no kid dreams of being a logistician, right? Kids say, I want to be a policeman, I want to be a doctor, a teacher, right? Uh, nobody says, I want to grow up to be a logistician, a supply chain manager, right? So, so uh, you know, I went to college in the evening, so I worked full time during the day, right? I put myself through college. I, I paid, I paid, you know, I've been fortunate enough to have been able to position myself to pay through all my education from uh, college all the way to my MBA. Um, but yeah, it was during those years, early years of college, when I was looking for a job to be able to sustain myself. And there was this small um, maritime agency looking for a sales rep. And um, I found, well, what is a maritime agency? What do they do? What? Well, a maritime agency is a ship broker. Uh, ship brokers represent ocean carriers in ports around the world. So this, this small maritime agency was looking for a sales rep uh, to expand the market in Barranquilla. So I jumped at the opportunity, went to the process, got the job, really liked the sales role, but I was more curious about the operational side of the maritime field. And that's when an opportunity became available for me to jump into a documentation role. So the guy that, that uh, prepares all the documentations for imports and exports within the agency. And from there on, I moved to another. I was recruited by the back then largest ocean carrier in the world, Evergreen Marine, wow. to work as an operations representative. So then from there, I moved on to operations assistant manager and then operations manager, in which I was managing the entire operation at port. And I was still in college. So I've, I've been a, a very, always all my life, learning oriented individual. And this was a, pl a place where I could learn so much about so many different businesses in real time in a fast paced environment. It sounds like you found something that you're extremely passionate about and you pursued it vigorously, but you, in the back of your mind, still had that, that connection to education. And it, it seemed like it uh, pulled you back from the sea and brought you back into the classroom uh, like uh, other parts of your family. Just looking over your work at the University of Maryland, it is, it is amazing. I'm just very, very impressed with everything that you're, you're doing. Um, you. If you will, uh, tell us a little bit more about what you're doing at the University of, of Maryland and, and give us the background story on kind of what brought you here. Well, so at the University of Maryland, I teach almost anything and everything supply chain management. <laughs> As the academic director for the master's program in supply chain management, I collaborate with others within my department to provide a program that prepares students with must-have 
my, uh, sought after skills in supply chain management. So we're constantly working on improving our academic offer, making sure that our program is aligned with industry needs. And almost every year or so, we go through a revision of the program, the curriculum, and we introduce new courses. We drop courses that are not working well, and we find ways to improve the skills that our students graduate with. And we focus on making sure that our students are higher ready, that they hit the ground running with must-have skills in supply chain management. So in addition to that, I also teach courses, uh, of course, in at all levels. So the undergraduate level, I teach introduction courses in supply chain management. The master's level, I teach for the master's program in supply chain management. I teach um, a course that focuses on financial intelligence for supply chain managers, basically establishing connections between operational performance and financial statements. And for the MBAs, I teach from process improvement to global supply chain management. Yeah, you, it's amazing how many different aspects of supply chain management uh, there are and how many that you're teaching. In the next couple of questions, I want to help our audience understand how you develop your teaching methods. Uh, can you help us understand the meaning of experiential learning? Well, yes, of course. Experiential learning, to put it simply, is basically learning while doing. You know, if I had to say in a succinct way, learning while doing. It's a way of learning that focuses on active participation and hands-on experience. It's about involving students in, in direct experiences that are relevant to the subject matter. And in the process, encouraging them to reflect on those experiences and extracting meaningful insights from them. One of the main advantages of experiential learning is that students gain deeper understanding and retention of the material. Of course, as well as the ability to apply their knowledge in real world context. It's some sort of workshop learning, if I have to describe it in a way. Um, when I think of experiential learning in, in my classes and in particular in the use of, of, of VR, experiential learning can take so many forms that of course will depend on, on learning goals. For example, field trip where students visit relevant locations to observe, interact with, and, and perhaps learn from the environment is a type of experiential learning. We do field trips a lot in the program. Another example of experiential learning is role-playing or simulations. We do those too, where students are assigned specific roles or, or scenarios that replicate real world situations. An example of this could be uh, the negotiations class that we teach in the MS program. Students participate in a, simulate, in a simulated buying experience where they take on roles of buyers and sellers and they negotiate prices and, and, and make business decisions while they are learning. Through these hands-on experiences, our students gain practical knowledge and develop problem solving and decision-making skills. Now, here, here's one thing, experiential learning has been widely recognized as an effective educational approach backed by research and evidence. Higher retention rates, for example, is one of the greatest advantages. There's an organization called the National Training Laboratory or NTL.org. They perform a study on, on, retention, on retention rates and, and their study revealed some outstanding discoveries. They found out that 5% of information, that students will retain 5% of information through lectures, right? So through a regular lecture, students will retain 5%. Through reading, students retain 10%. Through demonstrations, students retain 30%. And here's the kicker, through experiential learning, students retain 75% through practice by doing. So, you know, I've been fascinated about how experiential learning 
can improve the learning experience of my students. I can stand and speak for hours in a classroom, right? Is that my goal? No, it's not my goal. My goal is for my students to learn. Another study by the Association of Experiential Education, I think is the name, the Association for Experiential Education, found that students engage, students that engage in experiential learning have higher academic achievement compared to those in traditional classroom settings. They demonstrated increased knowledge retention, improved problem solving skills, and better application of concepts. And there are a number of other studies that support enhanced critical thinking and problem solving skills, increased motivation and engagement and, re uh, and development of soft skills, amongst others, when students learn in an experiential learning setting. Wow. So Roberto, I have, I have to ask, do you also teach uh, the sales classes at the University of Maryland? <laughs> I am completely sold on experiential learning. Uh, that was a magnificent answer. Thank you uh, for, for providing that. I am curious. I think there's probably a pretty good background story here as well. How did you, how did you connect virtual reality to um, the power of experiential learning? So I consider myself a subject matter learner, not a subject matter expert, as well as an innovator. I love that. Um, you know, I, I always tell my students, you know, at every, <laughs> every semester, let's learn together, right? Because, you know, I believe that teachers, instructors, faculty, we are learning more than our students. You know, when I face a class of 35 students, 40 students, I'm learning so much from all their, their perspectives, all their approaches, everything they know, I'm absorbing like a speech. So back to your question. I love finding new ways to help my students learn. And one of the goals I have as an instructor, as I said earlier, is to make my students learn, right? Uh, not to just stand in front of a class and speak for an hour and 15 or an hour and 50 minutes. That's not my goal. You know, I want to make my lectures as memorable as possible. So students don't have to study much, right? Have you noticed how when you watch a great movie or documentary, you can then retell the story without having to read a script, right? So you watch your best movie and then you can, oh, what was it? What was the movie about? And you can tell the story, right? That's what I'm constantly pursuing every, every class, in every class. I want my students to be able to retell the story, in this case, my lecture, without having to resort to their notes or their, or their books, right? And so I'm constantly, and for every lecture, brainstorming about the best way to tell the story in the most engaging way possible. You know, there are, of course, some topics that no matter how engaging you make them, they're just so difficult to teach in a classroom setting as they require asking students to imagine things. Warehousing and distribution is a key component of supply chain management. And for years, I had struggled teaching this topic. A key concept such as cross-docking, you know, perhaps you're not familiar, but those that, you know, some people may be, requires asking students to imagine a warehousing environment. This is so challenging because, you know, on average, one out of 35 students in my class have been to a distribution facility. So last year in the spring, the University of Maryland put out teaching innovation grants, great grants. I thought this was a great opportunity to bring some innovation into the classroom and reimagine the way my students learned. So I worked with a coworker who just retired, by the way, to write a proposal, the best proposal on the use of immersive technologies in the classroom. And the rest is history, right? We were awarded the grant. We collaborated with a developer to set up the VR experiences and voila. My students now can learn warehousing and distribution from their dorms in the most experiential way. They learn from 
flow optimization, to layout optimization, to warehouse capacity, to the newest technologies being used today in supply chain management in a distribution environment, such as robots, uh, autonomous vehicles, et cetera. Everything from their dorms. Wow. So there's so much to break down there. First of all, I'm completely going to take the term subject matter learner from you and use that in the future. I love that. I'll also add a comment that you gave the really, I think you said 75% retention with experiential learning. I've heard, and I think you've just verified it, uh, something that's probably even more powerful than experiential learning is actually becoming a teacher and having to teach a topic. I've always heard that if you can teach it, you probably have gained a very high level of learning, you know, mastery over a topic. Uh, you don't want to be up in front of students and not know your stuff. So <laughs> if, the, if there's one thing that's better than experiential learning, it's, it's, it's actually being a teacher and being uh, in front of the class. But I love the fact that you have this relationship, this partnership with your students to where you're on a journey together, where you're both uh, you're, you're all learners in the classroom. So that's really powerful. Listen, to, to, uh, add to, to, to what you're saying, if I may interject, to add to what you're saying, one thing that I tell my students is this, flat out from the beginning of the class, hey, listen, guys, nobody knows everything, right? Nobody knows everything. So you're saying, you know, have all this stuff. You just said something that, that, that triggers something in my mind. I tell my students this, I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the truths. With my experience and my knowledge, I could just find a way to answer any questions you may have, but I choose not to do that. So every once in a while, you know, it happens once a semester, some of you will come up with, with questions for which I don't have the answer. And I'm gonna tell you, I don't have the answer for that, but I'll research it and I'll get back to you tomorrow. Because, you know, I, I think to the extent that you're transparent with your students and, and your students can see you as, as, as a normal person, like I'm a normal person um, and I'm not a computer or anything, uh, they trust you more. They know that I'm not going to tell them anything that is not um, research backed or based on my experience, my direct business experience. If I don't know the topic, I don't know the topic, I'll tell them, you know, uh, Right at the moment, I'll research the topic and I'll come back with an answer. That's uh, that's very admirable of you. I mean, that's uh, that takes I know a lot of effort and a lot of work, um, but it's again your students I'm sure appreciate that. The second part of statement that I wanted to unpack a little bit was when you're talking about bringing the most amazing cutting edge aspects of business into the student's dorm room, that's that's extremely powerful. It seems like you'd want to do that for all of your classes. How do you how do you pick which classes are best for the use of virtual reality? Can you use them in any class or are there particular classes that it's just a better fit for? Very good. So so the short answer is no, I don't use them in every class. That's a short answer. Right. Uh, the long one is not all courses lend themselves for this type of learning. For example, um, in a finance course, you may not need this type of experiential learning using VR. You may do some other experiential learning, such as, for example, visiting uh, uh, a stock exchange and learning how things are. That's experiential. Right. Or, or perhaps visiting a band can learn that's experiential. But when talking about VR, virtual reality, uh, 360 videos, augmented reality, all these type of realities that that uh, require special hardware, such as the, the, the headsets, not all courses, at least today, not all courses lend themselves for this. In, as I mentioned in my in one of my courses where I teach supply chain financial intelligence, we rely a lot on spreadsheet modeling and, and 10K reports and information from real companies. We don't have to immerse, use this type of immersion for this, for, to achieve the goals of this course. The 
some courses are more required or benefit students if you have an immersive experience. Let me tell you some of those, that some of them are now in the making and some of them, uh, and, and the one that I'm teaching, the one, I, the one I'm teaching is, is a warehouse module in VR. So in this, in, in this experiential learning, students immerse themselves. They put on their goggles, you know, they are assigned the headsets. The beginning of the semester here, you got your headsets. Everybody takes their headsets, they go home and they have some activities to do on their own. Some of the activities they do is they, they get on the environment and they can visit a facility. They can visit a distribution facility, you know, putting on the headsets. Other activities involve getting together with their teams in a simulated environment where they are all in avatar form and they can see each other and they can walk through the facility, right? Regardless of where their physical location is. Some of them may be in their dorm, some of them may be at home, it doesn't matter. They just have to choose a time where they meet, they open up, they set up the environment, they meet there, and they perform activities in the simulated warehouse facility. Some facilities include, for some activities include, for example, measuring the capacity of a warehouse. So they are assigned a warehouse and, and they're assigned uh, several tasks. Number one, you know, walk the facility and tell me uh, and, and draw a, a floor plan of the facility. And then some questions stem from that. Is this an optimal layout for the type of product this facility sells? Another, another type of activities that my students learn in the facility, in the simulated environment with their team members is they measure the capacity of a facility. They have to walk the facility, take notes of, because they look and they can interact with objects in the facility. They look at the the capacity the of the facility you know you can measure in terms of percentage how much the facility what is the the, the capacity the available capacity versus the use capacity and another activities include doing uh, cycle counting uh, with their team members they walk in the facility they pick a number of boxes and they do inventory cycle counting they inspect boxes they interact right this type of of learning goals warehousing benefits from this type of learning, of immersive learning. Another one, <laughs> excuse me, that we are building right now is negotiations, right? So in this, in this class, the goal is to provide students with um, strong negotiation skills. So basically they set up their goggles and they negotiate with an avatar. This avatar is measuring in real time some specific KPIs that measure assertiveness and other things that can help students improve their negotiation skills. So they're in front of an avatar negotiation, negotiating on a specific topic and the avatar in real time is measuring my students' abilities. At the end, they get a report, they improve those skills, they learn about the skills and then do it again. And over time, they're improving and reshaping the way they negotiate. There is a not, so not all courses lend themselves to an immersive or benefit from an immersive experience. A leadership course, for example, may help students develop their leadership style. There is uh, another faculty developing a course uh, on leadership where students are uh, getting to a stranded place, an island, and they are faced with, with managing and controlling the situation to the benefit of the team. So they all immerse in, the, in this experience and the, the solution measures different things, different aspects of their leadership style. So Again, in response to your answer, how do you decide which courses to use VR in is, is an art and a science, right? We have, to, we have to go from the learning objectives of the class and map that backwards. What are some of these learning objectives that would benefit from an immersive experience? And then if we identify some of those, then we build the, we build the module within the course, sometimes just goals are added. The technology is not, it's not that advanced as of today, but it's moving very fast. So I'm, I'm thinking we will be able to use this technology across more courses. Today, 
uh, it's a little bit challenging, but but we're we're managing it okay. It just seems like, I mean, what a wonderful learning experience. But it seems like it really requires a lot. Just imagining here, uh, you probably have to have a whole host of partners, industry partners, that can provide you uh, with the latest and greatest. Um, how their floor plans look in the warehouse or you know a new way of doing a particular task so once you have those partners identified then you have to go out and write the scripts it almost sounds like you have to be a writer a director and a producer for a movie and it all has to be based on learning objectives and learning outcomes. So what an amazing experience that you're bringing to these students, but how do you do it all? I mean, how do you put this together? It, it seems like um, quite, quite the effort and quite the task. It is. So it's like the chicken and egg problem without a chicken and without an egg. Where do you start, right? At least if you have the chicken, then you right. So it's 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 a it's a it's a complex uh, uh, balance between picking the right partner. We have a developer firm, excellent partner. We, we, these individuals, this this team has been instrumental in in bringing this to reality. And it's engaging in a discovery phase with them. I don't know what they know. They don't know what I need exactly because I only know, I know what I need, but I don't know if they can do it. And they don't know what they can do unless they know. It, it's, it's, it's very complex. So we engage in a discovery process, talking and talking and talking and talking. Sometimes I even, for example, for, for my, for this, uh, first iteration of, of this deployment warehousing in VR, one of the things that the discovery process took us or, or led us to do was, I'm gonna share my entire textbook with them. So I'm gonna share with the developers, here's a textbook that I'm teaching. Here's what I'm teaching today. So I wanted to go through it and find if there are things that you can do to help enhance the learning goals in these chapters. And so they went and they started going through the textbook and finding opportunities in which we can actually leverage something to bring into the environment. One top priority at the beginning was my warehouse in VR. I knew we could do it. I knew from the beginning that we could, that was my number one goal. I need to be able to expand and to enhance the learning experience of warehousing and distribution, this specific module. So we started from there. Now in the next iteration, we're going to have additional modules that we are right now building with them because now they know exactly what I teach and exactly what my learning goals are. They're going through that and working, putting together different solutions and integrations to bring it to the environment. But it, it's very complex, it's very complex. You can't um, sometimes, you know, for me, we didn't know what step one was. We, at the beginning, we had no idea what step one was, to be honest. So we just started to walk without knowing any direction. Now we have a direction. We have a starting point, the warehousing VR module. Now from there on, now we have other things that can be added to that to expand on others. Um, some of the additional things that can be done with this, uh, with this technology that, is, that are easier is to partner with, with corporate uh, uh, partners to teach our students how companies do it, you know, how DHL does operations. We can bring a module of those into the environment, how Walmart and different companies that might be potentially interested in having my students learn before they're actually hired by this company. So in other words, my classes could become a pipeline of fresh talent for a company such as Walmart that sees in my students, students that have been trained. The training phase has been moved from after hire to pre-hire. 
So I train the students in my classroom and then students can hit the ground running working for a company such as Walmart or FedEx or DHL or any of the largest corporations that use leverage VR in training their, their employees. That quite, uh, quite an achievement. That answers the question, what's in it for the employer? They get a near ready uh, employee that they have to spend less time onboarding. Correct. And the student, on the other hand, has a better understanding of what they're getting into before they show up on the job. Correct. So it just seems like it's a win-win for all parties involved. I want to go back and just ask one question about student participation. It seems essential. Do you get any pushback from students? Generation younger than us, they say the you know, first generation born where the digital world's and their native language. Are, are they loving this? Is this something that they are really embracing? Or does it seem to be something that's a little intimidating to them? Oh, man. <laughs> are they loving it? 120%. <laughs> so I don't even need, I don't even have to be biased. Hear my students' own words. This is awesome. This is phenomenal. It is a lot of fun. So this is what students have come to me to just tell me their experiences. Everybody's so excited about technology. This, as you said, you know, their first language is technology, right? So I was so surprised, not surprised, uh, I don't know, fascinated the word because at the beginning of the semester, uh, we have um, an intercession. In this intercession, I introduce students to the technology. So we have this intercession in the class, and this session is also a session where I officially hand out, assign a piece of hardware to each student, right? So we go through the entire session, just setting up the technology. So step one, step two, step three, step four, right? So it is, uh, fascinating how my students <laughs> went through the entire session of setting it up to getting everything in 15 minutes. Contrast that with a presentation, and this is not meant to make fun of anybody. Right? I'm not making fun of anybody. So I made a similar presentation with faculty in the business school. So the same event, boy, 40 minutes and not many of them even got to the end, right? So these students just put on the thing, click, 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 click. I got there, done, I'm done. I'm like, whoa. And then I try to do it with faculty, 40 minutes and many still didn't get to the end because they couldn't find where I was talking. They couldn't see it. Again. So technology is such, it's second nature to these students that it's a no brainer. It's, 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 if that's second nature, that's something that we should all be doing, right? If we know that's something that is easy for them, every single course, and I'm a proponent, I am uh, an advocate that every single course should have a technology component. It doesn't have to be VR. It doesn't have to be virtual reality. It can be anything technology-wise, right? Because technology is something that these newer generations, it's, it's just, they were born with that chip. I wasn't. I wasn't, I can barely work with my computer, right? Uh, but this, these newer generations yeah. are so fast that they get so that so fast. So based on that, every single course in every single major should have a technology component because it will make their learning process easier. We learn, you and I, we may be the same generation. We both learn from a book, you went to college, you sat through a one hour and 15 minute presentation, blackboard, you know, chalk on the boards, right? And then you went and you read from a boring book. That's what we did. That's the way we are wired to learn, right? No, the new generations, they have a laptop before they can eat the, or an iPad before they can even write words. They play Angry Birds. They play all sorts of games. They're already familiar with the digital thing. And if we know that's that's part of the DNA, we should be leveraging that across colleges and universities, not colleges and universities, 
high schools, right, across America, technology should be something, a strong component of every single aspect of their learning. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's incredible. We've covered the students. We've covered everything that you have to put into this. We've covered the employer. I think we've dealt pretty well with the 360 degrees of what you're doing. It's really amazing the intersection that you have tapped into between experiential learning and technology, how you're bringing that to the classroom. I think what we still need to cover is, and you've alluded to it in some of your answers, but where are you going with all of this? Uh, you, you talked about kind of, you didn't really have, you know, the chicken or the egg. You really didn't have a roadmap at first. Now you have a good idea. You, you, you put some markers on the board. What's next? Where, where are you taking this? Very good. Very good. Joel, thank you. This is a great question. It, it fills me with excitement <laughs> because, uh, you know, this is just the beginning of the use of this technology. As we speak today, as we're talking right now, I'm partnering with another faculty in my department at the, the Smith School of Business to take this to the next level. What is the next level of, and, and I can only talk about supply chain management, right? Because in the business school, even though I, I, I'm the first one to, be, to bring this technology in the, in the business school uh, for, to reimagine the way our students learn, now that I presented it to other faculty and now other faculty know uh, what can be done, there are other faculty working on how to bring this VR technology to other programs, right? So my department is the department of logistic business and public policy, but we have accounting, finance, we have other departments and they're now working on this. But in my department, I'm partnering with another faculty to the next generation of this uh, of the use of VR or experiential learning. We're going to deploy in the spring 2024, a new course. It's a new course that is intended only for supply chain majors, just supply chain majors. And students will learn, it's a 14 week course. Students will be learning during the first part of the course, they will be learning everything, distribution of warehousing environment, technologies and everything they have, they have to learn about warehousing uh, as a critical component of every supply chain. And then in the second part of the course, we are partnering with a company. We're partnering with different companies so that students can have a mini consulting project. So the next eight weeks of the course, students will be working on site. It doesn't get any more experiential than this. First, you do your experiential learning with the use of, of technology, and then you go and work on site with different companies to help them optimize distribution and warehouse operations. So this, this course will have a capstone project, which is the deliverable, recommendations on how to improve the distribution operation, recommendations of process improvement, all sorts of recommendations. And we're going to um, help partners have students learn in a more even more hands-on approach, and it's going to be a win-win for all the parties involved. Berto Coronado, amazing work. I love what you're doing. Wow. I'm sure your students are very appreciative. I know that the peers and, and leadership at the Robert H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland are also very appreciative, and most of all, I think the employers are appreciative as well. So again, win-win for everyone involved. I'm so impressed with uh, what you're doing. I, I love your passion for education. I love your story. I, I, I really, uh, really appreciate what you're bringing and as far as innovating education and uh, really appreciate you being a part of what we have going on with this podcast. Uh, any closing remarks before we wrap things up? Yo, uh, my closing remarks are thank you so much for the invitation. You know, I will continue to be an advocate for technology applications in education, right? Regardless of the field, I believe that's the future of learning, you know, bringing in new technologies and applying them to the way we learn right? It's easier today than ever. Technology is moving very fast. 
at you know light speed and our newer generations are already familiar with them so I think you put two and two together and it's anybody that is in education can see the benefits of innovating with these newer technologies that are already there to help better prepare our students for the future, to help train the next generation of leaders in a better way. So I'll continue to do that. Thank you so much for inviting me today. This was such a great experience for me. And, uh, you know, uh, if you need anything else, Joel, just reach out. I'll be happy to, to contribute in any way I can. Well, thank you for being uh, a part of our podcast. Again, last thing I'll say is I'd love to have you as a professor. So uh, never, all of us are lifelong learners. So I, I may just be over there at uh, your, your, your school here taking a class from you at some point in the future. Uh, but again, really appreciate you. We'll, we'll definitely be in touch with you to see how things are going, how you move this along. Uh, and so we talk again, I appreciate you and uh, we'll talk soon, all right? Thank you so much, bye-bye.